And how do you feel about this kind of like crossing the streams here? I am beyond excited. Listen up, Umi. This is a podcast with the most darker. This is Forge the Narrative. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host for the Lost Halls podcast. I'm joined by Adam Camilleri. Hello. Adam, it's just you and I right now. So it's got some og about it. <laughs> In the middle of this show, I'm actually going to do a special segment with uh, Pleasant Kenobi. Fantastic, and gentlemen. After that, uh, we'll come back uh, with us and we'll see. We'll see who can round up uh, for that last segment. Might just be you and I again. Is what it is, man. But what I talk about with Mr. Kenobi is the comparisons between a healthy competition environment in games. And specifically, we talk a little bit about Magic the Gathering and the comparisons to how uh, Wizards of the Coast interacts you know, with their match play, organized play structure and and I thought it you know it'd be cool to have that kind of care- comparison between Warhammer 40,000, Age of Sigmar and the like and you know I thought also be a good topic for you not to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. It's um it's a absolute, very very interesting thing in our game uh, especially because I don't want to say there's it's it's you, there are no comparisons out there for the competitive tabletop miniatures game, but they're very few and far between. For as for where do we go to find frames of reference for what we should be aiming for as a community if if this is something we want um, as in to have a competitive system and I've thought about this a little bit in, in the fact that I was thinking like well you know magic isn't the same because you don't have to paint models and whatever but mm-hmm. I thought well yeah there is a monetary component to magic as well and and then the more I thought about it and not not to like jump to the end of the conversation but the more I thought about it is, is the closer you try to play to the bleeding edge the more likely you are to get cut yeah I mean uh, yeah absolutely magic is a lot of it well the turn the turnover in magic is even people who say the turnover in 40k is becoming uh, erroneous or too quick as in the rules turn you mean over when or things rotate out so when yeah, things are, yeah. are no longer either in fashion or just change because of some rotation in in points or mm. something you know something something changes yeah which could have been the, the comparison with magic is there uh, ma- magic you know was it every other month or is it every three months a new yeah. set comes out so i don't know the exact release schedule but i know that that there are sets that rotate out every couple of years or so and then new sets rotate in every at least every quarter or every six months or something like that yeah yeah uh and so and f- like I believe that like there could be something that we're leading to that we're headed towards in 40k. You know, you know we got like a uh, the different you know Nachman books and different chapter approved books and it, here and there and whatnot, um, having different you know slight variations on the same play structure, um, and th- that could very well be somewhere we're headed. So there's definitely some comparisons to look at there. But you're right that I mean you don't need to paint miniatures, you don't need to build miniatures, and whilst magic is quite expensive, it's I I would argue. That, you know, how much does it a deck of 60 cards for the standard Magic, you know, competitive event cost? You compare that to a standard 2,000 ploy list, and I think the monetary difference would be enormous. Uh, right. And and so a lot of that value on the Magic side is talk, is is the secondary market of cards. And, you know, that's, that's probably something that we talk about with Pleasant Kenobi. So let's just assume that magic is a, com- is a competitive environment that's is gone on, been going on for years. It's kind of established mm-hmm. to how yeah. it works and there, and they do things like ban cards are, or sets rotate out or whatever that help craft this environment for organized play. Now on the um, Warhammer 40,000 side or Games Workshop side in general, you know, we've seen that kind of gel up over the last, how has it been two years? Um, since GW has been back, like, so they've been actively trying to balance the game and engage in the competitive side of things. Since the start of 8th edition, you know, they, they did that wipe at the end of 7th. And since then, they've been actively trying to achieve balance. But yeah, their, their full support all in on the competitive side of things is, yeah, the last two years or so. And like chapters, chapter approved and things like that. And and so I guess the question is, is, is it enough? Is it 
is it too much, you know, and then who's really impacted by these changes to for us to influence an opinion of mm. is it too much or enough? You know, it's, I know we're, 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 we're soul searching here for a minute. Yeah. We're, we're kind of trying to look deep to see how we feel about this. Um, as two, as two people who both engage in the competitive scene pretty heavily. Um, and, and study <laughs> it and analyze it. Yeah. Yeah. In multiple different facets as well. We're not just players, you and I, um, shoutcasting, you know, podcasting, uh, all these things. Uh, I think, see, what G-Dub is trying to do, and I've said this multiple times on, the, on this show in particular, um, the, the task ahead of G-Dub is monumental. They're, and it's only getting harder and bigger. They have more factions than like any other balanced game can can shake a stick at. Like you think about a lot of esports, a lot of video games. You, like StarCraft is a great example. Um, not only because you know they ripped off 40k, but um, <laughs> also because uh, they've got three factions. It's very easy to balance three factions. You know, it's very easy to get a bit of a rock paper scissors happening between them, but then some interplay, some deeper values be- below that. I'm um, different builds and archetypes and rotations and build orders and all that stuff that happen in that game. What are we up to now? Leagues of Votan coming out. Are we up to like 18 core factions? Uh, and then I think it's like 24. Yeah, and then sub factions therein. This is a monumentally hard thing to balance. Like, think of board games uh, too that that rarely have more than five or six yeah, factions. Yeah, I mean, I was for a while there, especially in Eighth Edition, when I could see that GW, while not floundering, were trying to find their feet. As you know, as as how do we balance this game? What a you know, um, I I was of the opinion back then they needed to sandbox it. They needed to be like. Um, here, like here's the here's the the open play and here's the competitive play and the competitive play for this six months or a year you can't use these units in your army, or you have to use this exact. Um, we'll, we'll bring out an exact. Uh, oh wow, you went cap- right for the band stick. You just like yeah yeah actually okay. narrow sandbox the amount of units and choices. Don't no, don't sandbox factions. Every faction should be playable at all times, but. You know, remove some of the erroneously hard things to balance. You know how hard Space Marines would be to balance? Just Space Marines? There's like 90 data sheets. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know how hard? There's 90 like units in that army. How do you... You need a team to, to get perfect balance. You would need a team to just balance Space Marines. You'd need a team to just do the Xenos. You'd need a team to just do, you know, yeah, uh, chaos. Um, it's, fo- it's monumentally hard. Um, and they're doing what well, we have seen a consistent pair up of how much they're doing as well. So, but it's also in ninth edition, and this is there's there's a lot of external factors that have made this the case. We've seen it be somewhat inconsistent. Like in eighth edition, it was very predictable. You'd get a you'd have your army would have an index, and then they would get a codex, and then within a month they'd get an FAQ to that codex, and then you'd get another codex, and within a month another FAQ to that codex. Um, that hasn't been as consistent in ninth edition. Um, for whatever reasons, I'm sure there's plenty of very good ones. We, it's been a phenomenally crazy three years. But yeah, they've paired up. We're getting uh, by by yearly um, points updates now, rather than just yearly points updates. In addition to by yearly mission updates um, and competitive mission updates. So I think it's headed the right direction because, it, like with um, Magic, you can't just when they have they ha- they have only 10 sets or however many sets of cars existing in the in the competitive format at one time what they call air quotes standard play mm-hmm. um if we could do something similar and, and there are other formats but we're oh, you, know, sure. yeah. you and I are talking right now about you know whatever the uh, the non eternal format is yeah yeah they've got modern as well they've got historic they've got commander they've got yeah all sorts um but if we were just to talk about their standard play, competitive play versus our competitive play, um, they have 10 sets, you know, 10 sets of cards, which maybe, let's just say, theoretically have 100 cards in each. Oh, it's yeah? more than that. It's actually, I know, like, I know. you're going to, you're yeah. like, this, your, your example might get out of hand here in a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I was about to say, but even then, they have, like, let's say they just have a thousand, 1,000 things to balance. And some of those are lands and stuff that just kind of take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, we have just in Space Marines, we have 100, yeah, give or take. And then within Space Marines, we have how many different chapters within uh, Space Marines? Yeah, all, needing their, all needing their own variants, their own flavor. They're all unique units, their own wall of traits, relics, uh, psychic powers, stratagems. Like, you want to talk about how much more complex this gets for 40k balance. Um, it's a phenomenal task. And... Um, Whilst I don't think up to up to right now, I don't think they've done a great job with it. Uh, mostly because they went for like nine months without helping at all um, in the middle of COVID. Well, no, let's talk about the, the now. Is that I, I think that we're, the balance data slates, the the fact that chapter approved is a thing, you know, and 
like I, I think this is all cumulative of us being in a good spot. Like I am of the opinion we're in a good spot. Um, mm. Is it? I, but I guess is it too much? But I also want uh, to have. And I'm not saying things can't be good. You know, I always think things it's fine for things to be powerful and good. Uh, but I like everyone to feel like they have their their codex has a shot at taking down mm. a you know a major or whatever. And that seems to be you know kind of where the game is going is to where they're they're not they're not afraid to make some of these bold updates. But is it is it frequently enough? Are they hands on or hands off enough at the moment? Um, I think that like. We've we've got to give them the floor, so to speak. You know, we've got to give them um, the rope to lift themselves up or hang themselves with it. You know, like to 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 prove to us that they can do it. And they have paired up recently this year from you know to the quarterly balanced data slates and and the biannually points updates. So I mean, yes, but then now we have to wait for. Yes, they are doing enough as long as the execution's there. As long as they make consistently make the right choices, this is enough, I think, to mm-hmm. to make the game into a golden era we should of expect amazing balance well, well we're giving we should it want it you know we should want it we, that should be the aim the aim should be perfection um you remember in eighth edition yeah we didn't have it for long but we had like a five to six month period of possibly per, a perfect game of phenomenal game balance index was, warhammer <laughs> no it was it was actually after the orcs and gsc books and pre prior to the second space marine book we had a a, a meta game where competitively, just about everybody had a shot. There was one or two that maybe had less than others, but there was a huge, really healthy middle tier, and then just one or two at the top that were very beatable. Um, and that was the to my, uh, that is the best any forty any competitive any tabletop game has ever felt to me. Um, was that six months? And then we know what happened with Space Marine 2.0 and all that stuff. But yeah, that should be the goal to get back to where that was sustainably for multiple years. Like, could you imagine an edition of the game where everyone just felt like they could win? Everyone just felt like they their their faction was enjoyable to play and had multiple builds, exciting things to do. Like, you know, you could you could you could get an army that wasn't just like what Harlequins had when their book came out, which was nine void weavers and some misc bits. You know, you had an army where you wanted to get six, seven, ten thousand points of every faction that you liked because everything was playable. That should be the dream. Uh, yeah, Eldar are, are pretty much that way. Uh, oh, Asurani are that way right now. Yeah, you yeah. could you could just get twenty thousand points and everything. But yeah, if every but the but that's the end goal, right? That every army is that yeah, way. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly right. Every army is that way. Every army has that depth, that excitement, that intrigue, that interest. Um, and that multiple, you know, styles of builds and enjoyment. Um, and I think we can do it. G- GW have taken us to the promised land multiple times in additions. I think the last time we had that, and this is kind of rough to say, prior to my experience with that in 8th edition, the only other time I'd felt the same was the first kind of year of 5th edition, which you might be able to speak to more than me. I was a bit in and out of the game then. I was in early teens yeah, no, it, yeah, it was good. It was really good, right yeah. up until the demons and uh, and, and Grey Knight books came out, and then it went a bit silly. Yeah, Grey Knights. Uh, yeah, I've got my fe- I've got some feelings around Grey Knights, but I also played Grey Knights, so I really I was part of the problem. <laughs> you were part of the problem. <laughs> uh, you love it. Uh, but back then, you know, the, there wasn't this uh, proactivity mm. with like nudging the the game, and it really we're to, to people playing out there how they want. Uh, continue that. I'm, I'm talking about specifically for a competition environment to where you don't, because going out there and like going, even going from game store to game store, you know, I, I could walk into a game store anywhere in the world and just say, let's play a two play 2k match play game. And we know we don't have to spend a bunch of time talking about the setup or whatever. Mm-hmm. We yep. can just play and great, have a great experience. We've got that now. Your, your friendly games. I was like, friend, God, this, there's no good way of just, dis- I have this vernacular and I'm not trying to be like that all games can't be friendly or whatever, mm-hmm. but in, um, in games where you're playing, you know, outside of the competition setting, you can do all this, have any discussion you want about, hey man, that unit just keeps wiping me off the table. I don't enjoy playing against it because you leave it at home today. Can we play a game where that didn't happen? You can have that kind of discussion with folks and people should be empowered to do it. Uh, don't don't ever think that you can't. But in, in a regulation setting, you know, you, you can't do that. The game's got to help us out. And I think mm. the game is helping us out. And I think this proactivity that we've seen now is probably on the right track. And I would even, I could stomach a little, little more of it. Yeah, I could stomach 
uh, as much as they could give me <laughs> is, is, the, is the way I think. I mean, for you, you and me, we 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 well, lap this stuff up. We are I don't I don't want it to be changed all the time. Like I don't want to be like yeah. where where okay what now like how, what you know ten minutes ago it was something else. You know I like I like yeah. I want pred- uh, predictability in in the in the change, and I think that's kind of where we're going. Yeah, ex- exactly right. Yeah, you want plotability, predictability. Like I would love to even. I mean, they they even they tell us pretty much which month these things are going to come out in, and I always assume it's going to be the last week of that month. But like having a date for this stuff like just having like this is um the rules dates like it will be out by this date would give a lot of predictability to um tournament organizers and events where they could be like okay well if we can either go the week before this date or the week after this date people would stop would leave that date open events wise because they'd be like well that's that's rules day baby that's the day everybody jumps online and talks about the biggest yep. bestest changes and gets excited about the future and stuff um and then you know it would give a lot of predictability for people out there wanting you know, to 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 have some new stuff to be excited about for their for their um their games. Uh, a Necron player who might be like, well, uh, my my army isn't great at the moment, but after that date, I better start getting some stuff ready because it's going to be back on, baby. We're going to be reanimating and um, <laughs> you know, they reanimate Breathing their passion for their new faction. Life. There you go. I was searching for the pun as well. Uh, me too. Uh, uh. But. Yeah, so I do think there is a lot of that to it as well. Plotability, predictability is kind of where I want want it to go from now. I want to, um, I want the, what they're doing. I love what they're doing. Uh, the balanced data slate they just pulled out, um, the one with Armor of Contempt on it, and the changes to Miracle Dice and the other bits and pieces, um, show just how broad and big they're willing to go to change the game to make it more healthy. Because we've seen, like, I mean. You didn't. You didn't see sisters, man, did you? We we on on the various other programs and shoutcasts that we do, like sisters, grey knights were st- or, or where they, they were on the decline, and both had very have very exciting, very good ninth edition codexes, modern ninth edition codexes, and they were both on the decline. One little change from G Dub, resurgent, exciting, Back brand new winning tournaments, yeah. Brand new builds and archetypes are available to them. Um, so yeah, I like how big and broad they're willing to go. Like they're re- willing to just say, "Hey, you know what? Are you wearing power armor? You get this buff now." That's exciting that they're willing to go that big. Nice. Well, let's take a quick break. Uh, then we will give the floor to our special guest, Vince, who uh, will have a chat. You know, comparisons between the games, get some insight from that side of the shop. He also plays Warhammer. Been pretty active going to tournaments and that kind of stuff. So uh, I got some really interesting things to say. And then. We'll come back. Oh, also check out our sponsor. I got some amazing deals on some of those things we talked about. Uh, go check out Discount Games. See you in a minute. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hello and welcome everyone to a Community Spotlight segment here on Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul. I'm joined by Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. Man, how are you? I am very good, thank you. Just getting over COVID, but besides that, I'm very good. Oh, uh, Hopefully it was a mild case and you are on the mend. I, I am indeed, although you can definitely hear in my voice that I've got like some lingering cold-like symptoms, but I'm good, I'm good. Nice. Well, thanks for taking the time. And uh, you've been on the show before. Welcome back. No, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it last time. So on this episode, in this segment, I would li- kind of like to talk about, you're, you're primarily known for card games. You've got a yeah, channel. Yeah. You're on other channels. People should check you out. Uh, like put a lot of color- compelling, thought-provoking content out there. And then just some fun stuff, which is neat. But I wanted to talk about, um, I mean, Magic is the card game that I'm referring to specifically. And they have various formats over there. And those formats you know, go through periods of revision each year. You know, different. Sometimes it's in the form of banning. Sometimes it's in the in the form of restrictions. You know, and well, we can talk about that. I don't want to frame it too too narrowly. <laughs> but then on the on our side, you know, you also play Warhammer. You know, you've been going to tournaments recently. You've been tearing it up out there, having a great time. You got a lot of hobby videos out, so people should check it out if they are curious, looking for something else to listen to. And so you play both things, and I wanted to talk about the comparisons, you know, uh, differences and similarities between trying to keep these kind of healthy, competitive, or fun environments through things like rules adjustments one way or another. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess we could um, like preload this with explaining exactly, like, because obviously the majority of people listening to this podcast are going to be Warhammer and probably 40k fans, right? But um, so, so Magic's Competitive is, is up into different formats that basically allow you to play cards from a certain card pool, basically from a starting date. So Modern allows you everything from around 2000 and off the top of my head, three, I think it is. Uh, Legacy is everything. And Standard is normally the last couple of years. 
Um, Standard is the interesting one as the mainstay of Magic because it rotates. So you have a new set will come out and the last set from two years ago will like fall off and not be available anymore. Personally, I think this is uh, not the best competitive format because it makes the barrier to entry even higher. We all know that like Magic decks and Warhammer armies are expensive, right? Imagine having painted up or get units together and then some of them become not legal in two years' time. So I'm not it's not that they're that. not <laughs> fashionable to take anymore, is that you just cannot take Exactly, those exactly. They are literally not legal anymore there is an argument that that happens in 40k like an artificial rotation and we see it with each codex where new things are better than they used to be and old things aren't as good like look at eighth going into ninth right like leviathan dreads were all over ebay at the beginning of ninth because no one wanted them anymore because they just weren't good enough. and centurions too right centurions were the the height of favor at some point in eighth and then ninth they literally took bolter discipline off them and stuff right you can see that they adjust the rules to create a form of rotation but magic's is for standards at least is literal they're like this set all of zendikar rising or whatever block you want to think about is now no longer legal once the the latest set comes out which does make a dynamic environment and makes people have to innovate but i'm not a fan of that style of competitive play because i think it creates a huge barrier to entry and makes people have to just like you know you can't just come back with your army from like two years ago and give it a go because your deck will no longer be legal yeah, as those things have r- rotated out, as that's the the nomenclature. Yeah, exactly. I think. It's, it's literally called rotation. Yeah, yeah. Boom. And I mean, we've we've got seasons coming to Warhammer, haven't we? They just landed. We've started on the seasonal thing, but I don't think they're going to rotate anything. They're rotating things out of the shop. People feared at first when those articles went up that that meant they're going to rotate out of play. Right? I remember my Discord was very, oh no, are they rotating certain characters out of into Legends, if you will? But that didn't happen, thank goodness, because I think that'd be a very bad idea. Well, we kind of have a template, you know, with uh, with Sigmar. You know, they're they're in the season and they're going through. They're in the realm of Gur, like they're in a, playing in a very particular realm, and so some of the missions and things that are the focus are focused around that realm. And I think that's cool. I mean, there's nothing like that in Warhammer Forty Thousand at the moment, other than the fact that when we uh, when we got a change in this year's missions, it went from you know, retrieving uh, Nachman data. Yeah, you know, they changed to, the names to fit the war yeah, zone, right? data to Nachman data, you know. But, then, but that said, the next GT packet supposedly has different mission objectives for Sisters and Drakari, right? And a few others. They mentioned it in like a Warhammer comms article. So what that looks like, it might be that we get like themed objectives. I'm I don't here know for that's it. I don't want to get too speculative. You know, yeah, but I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm here for it. <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the topic of this segment. But <laughs> yeah, that could be a thing they do. They theme it around stuff. Uh, but there are things, you know, like with the balanced data slates, we're, we're seeing them quarterly. There's chapter approved and, and where points get changed around. Uh, and then if we can draw a comparison to magic, you know, we mentioned the rotation and we won't we won't necessarily talk about standard because I know that's n- not where you spend the most of your time, I don't think anyway. No, I, I play the eternal formats with like where older cards are legal, but but bannings happen regularly. Yeah, even in the like, eternal formats. Right. Yeah, some of these things, it changes there where uh, cards that combos, you know, that become about because of new new inventions or whatever, or just p- people have finally cracked the code on it you know there are cards no, that... absolutely there, there are cards that were absolutely useless and saw no play and then a new one will come out that will like you said combo or synergize heavily with that card and suddenly a card that was worth and this is the thing again will hammer as much because it's not there's no scarcity in the sense but a card that was 50 cents on the secondary market will suddenly be a 30 dollar card um i was playing this morning and colossus hammer is a good example of this it's like an uncommon that came out and it shotgunned it catapulted a load of old rares that interact with equipment but there was no good equipment to interact with it catapulted them to the forefront of moderns they became a tier one deck in modern that's now one of the best decks in the format it's the deck to beat if you're going to a tournament yeah it happens all the time and you see a bit of that with warhammer with like new units and models being released but nothing nothing tends to shift metas that severely like i mean thousand sun's got a chapter and style thing that buffs can buff vehicles this edition right but we didn't see it suddenly change thousand sons lists so that doesn't really happen in 40k as much yeah, we're just two folks talking by the way just kind of theorizing <laughs> living from staring at each other from different worlds uh talking about this but, stuff but that said though sometimes you get new stuff get get printed or created in 40k that does rock the meta game like look at look at uh the celestian sacrosancts right they were a new model in the new codex and they were they were cracked when they first come out, right? Like people were taking 20, 25, 30 of them and stuff. And slowly but surely they've been point hiked and they've been errated. The bodyguard all got changed, right? Yeah. 
So we, we do see kind of like how new cards can spike and be powerful. We do see new units come out and get pushed. I don't believe GW actually push every new unit to be great. Like, same book, the Castigator tank is terrible, right? So I don't think every new hey, kit is broken. it just broken. won a grand tournament with a Castigator oh, in there. I didn't, oh, I saw Sisters 1. I've been too busy to look at the list. I didn't know oh, Castigator no. was in that list. That's anecdotal evidence at best. I'm just saying that, you know, you know, there is. <laughs> I was literally arguing with a friend of one of my Discord uh, two days ago that the Castigator is not, not not worth it. And you take a third vet squad. It's very funny if they've just won a grand tournament with a Castigator. I'll have to check that out. But my <laughs> point is, not, not every new thing is broken. Like, okay, yeah. better example, the Banner Bearer. That was in the new book for Sisters. I can't remember her name. I've never yep. seen her on a tabletop. No one takes her. It's yep. just because she's more of a thematic or narrative thing. So I don't believe GW push everything with power creep, but there are new sheets and new updates and new units that do come out and they do shift the meta game. Yeah, so there's there's a there's a comparison with magic. And I guess as magic as I consider somewhat of the innovator in this space, although I think their formats are kind of driven by uh, player demand. Yeah. But, the, you know, what... As someone who's lived in that world for a long time, do do you think it, that Wizards has the obligation to do that, or is it uh, like necessitated by the the players or what have you? Like, where what what's leading the the uh, the changes over there? Um, so, so the creation of formats, like I said, like this is to answer this. So the creation of formats is player driven a lot of the time. Like the most popular thing in Magic at the moment is not even a tournament format. It's called Commander. It's a four player free for all. We get to play a load of silly cards you wouldn't normally play with. And that was community created originally, and then Wizards adopted it over time. And you see that as well where people tried to make a format called Frontier, but then Wizards adopted it and called it Pioneer, and that's now a thing that they're going to do at the Pro Tour. So formats are generated by demand to get to play with old cards that you love that have kind of been power cropped out of the game in some ways or aren't legal and standards that's that one the the adaptations that they make to those formats over time so the banning of cards um you mentioned restricting earlier that's not that's not very common that's only in vintage like the oldest format but banning a card so the card is no longer legally playable which you don't really see in 40k at all that is the purpose of that is to make the formats healthy so if a deck has is going if you look at the tournament stats across all the online and paper tournaments although paper tournaments haven't been around they're only just coming back after covid now uh, but if you look at all the stats, you see a deck has a 30% win rate or, or similar or like or, or higher. Or it's a 30% metagame share. Let's say it's not even winning its matches, but it's just it's cheap. It's uh, it's good. So everyone's playing it. Wizards will ban things to stop that being a problem. They are very slow to do that. They're almost careful about it. So you'll get people like myself making a lot of videos talking about how they need to fix formats. Like I don't think Legacy, which is my favorite format in the whole game, is healthy right now, but they're, they're sometimes very slow to act. Sometimes they take them a year to ban a card that everyone is saying is a problem, which perhaps is the best way to be. If they're banning things left, right, and center all the time, everyone would be quite upset because... Well, you know, well, you don't get a sense of like you know what's happening. You you're yeah. kind of very too cautious to do anything. Almost paralyzed, I think, if there's too much frequent change. There, there are situations where like they'll print a card. Um, there's a card called Hogak, which is a good example. It's, or Oko. Oko is probably the best one. A Planeswalker in a main set. It's in standard, and it was so good it broke standard, modern, legacy. It broke everything. It broke well, every format. <laughs> <laughs> was it that I mean, if I can get with Eldraine for a minute, that's the set it came from, right? Throne, yes, Throne of Eldraine. That's and it. and like as soon as they fixed one problem, there seemed like there was something else. <laughs> yeah, was... Yes. So 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 they went through a period of like kind of like we we're just saying about how certain new units and books are really powerful. We were getting every set would introduce like half a dozen to a dozen cards that would like warp older formats or break them entirely. And by break, I mean become the most prominently played thing and there's no reason to play anything else. That was a common thread for a while. We went from like Wizards almost never banning anything to bans every month in different formats. Just like bans are the norm now. Two or three years ago, if we had this conversation, I'll tell you that bans aren't as common as people think. Now bans happen quite regularly. They've calmed down again. The new sets aren't as powerful again. Uh, but Throne of Eldraine is one of the biggest culprits for that, yeah. O o Oko is one of the most broken cards they've ever printed. And he was like the face card of the set. He was like the big bad guy for the set. Um, but they banned him pretty quickly in some formats because he was so good. So obviously good. Um, took a bit longer for other ones. So sometimes they do react if it's ob absurd, like a 60% win rate, 50% metagame share. They're like, okay, this this needs to be fixed. Perhaps quicker than GW do. Because mm -hmm. there's an argument that Games Workshop didn't react well enough to Admech quick enough or Drakari quick enough. 
but again, there's that caution, right? You don't, you don't want to, like you said, you want to let the let the player base in the metagame breathe. But then there's there's a fine line to tread, right? <laughs> How imposing do you want the company to be in stepping in and fixing these things? But also, you don't want them pretending they're letting us adjust the metagame or letting the metagame adjust. And in reality, it's just not going to adjust because what they've printed or made is... Something in a release but, cycle. Like, if it is, is the game going to be good if four months of this, what is yeah, and that considered danger, punishment? Right? You know, because <laughs> people stop going to events, people stop watching stuff on Twitch. We see that in Magic a lot. Like, we have uh, standard is a format that I, I can't stand because of the rotation, but it's often very boring because they they're waiting for the next set to hit and the set to rotate out to fix it, and it'll just be boring when there's two good decks, everything else is terrible, and it will just be a boring format to watch. And we see that a lot. There's been a problem with the streaming presence of Magic and people watching streams. Because people get bored of seeing the same decks just smash into each other. Mm. There's an argument for that with Warhammer as well, because the top tables are often dominated by the same two to three factions at any one time, right? So in Warhammer, there's also there's the phenomenon of some of the best players in the world playing what is the new thing. And so, of course, they're going to do, be doing very well uh, because they're also great players. Do you, do you see that a lot in Magic? Or what is the desire or ratio of of being the meta versus trying to beat the meta and and what do the top players seem to gravitate to? I think the same thing happens in Magic as you see in Warhammer where the, the best players in the world will see the things that are evidently the best thing to be doing in the current like meta game and with the current tools available in magic it's a bit easier to switch between decks and change your decks because cards are a lot easier to shift in and out where with warhammer sometimes you've got to paint 120 skatari veterans or whatever <laughs> yeah the hobby lag exactly but and that's one of the big problems i think with competitive warhammer as a competitive game and as a tabletop esport or whatever you want to call it is that that hobby lag and that barrier stops a lot of players from even like you might have a guy who's very good at the game but he just doesn't have the time to paint you know, 13 orc buckies or whatever the latest thing is. So you see that in both games, but I think in Magic it's more common that people can just rent or borrow the cards from friends and do it, where with Warhammer you've got a select few who already have the collection or have the tools available to them to... Select into it. Oh, I already have... 300 conscripts so you know yeah yeah or well, they own a game store and they have a streaming channel so they've got an invested interest to be able to paint up these things anyway like you see that in the uk with like uh, this isn't slight to them i like the guys but like glass hammer i was chatting to manny and manny just has the opportunity to paint all these things because it's part of his business right like he's where your average person who's like this is their hobby and they don't compete and they don't have a store they may not have the chance to paint up all these buckies and skitari because it's just not practical but you get the same thing the best players will gravitate towards the best things you know in any game that is uh, one person wins over the other there's going to be a best deck or a best army or a best list or best tech right mm -hmm. so people will and the best players in the world will find that so you see that magic a lot do you think magic has it figured out with the frequency and I guess degree of touch that they put into curtailing the formats. Uh, let me curtailing maybe. Let me don't, let me rephrase that. Crafting the formats. Um. Oh, good question. Uh sometimes, sometimes they're doing a good job. Sometimes they're not. It really does vary. So I guess the answer is no, because sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're not. Yeah, um, well, I mean, we're gamers, man. Come on, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what, what I mean is, like, I I think it's good that Games Workshop have data slates and point changes. And I think it's good that Magic the Gathering has uh, bans and similar. I think it stops the game from degenerating into a uh, not fun thing to play. Um, whether they react fast enough is the big debate. I often think they don't. But at the same time, it's such a thin line, such a delicate balance. It's really hard to say by what degree they get it wrong. So there might only be mm -hmm. 5 or 10% over, if that makes sense. But that's a very wishy-washy answer. I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, no, I want to commit. Are they the best? You know, yeah. no. No, no, that's but, it's but, really because it is a bit of a finger in the air type type thing. Uh, yeah, how, you know how much is enough and how much is too much, and then how much is it does it factor into you know if if you're one of the people affected by the change, then you might dig it less. Yeah, uh, absolutely. They have you, when you get your force nerfed, it's it's not great, right? It's kind of it's kind of frustrating. And then in you know with some of these formats, you know the eternal formats that you mentioned that a lot of them do open up to the entire card range so your collection never goes out but there's also there's multiple formats within the internal format so there's what legacy slash vintage uh you know then you mentioned the the pioneer and the yeah, modern yeah. i mean is modern even a thing anymore yeah mo modern's still a thing modern's still one of the more popular uh eternal formats so that's everything from um uh eighth edition onwards so eighth edition kamigawa that period everything from then onwards to present day where legacy is everything and the reason i'm mentioning that is that those are almost like 
lanes or categories that people fall, kind of fall themselves into to play within, and they have certain expectations about those experiences when they are choosing to play it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, people, people like myself gravitate towards the eternal formats because it allows you to play with stuff that you grew up with or old decks that you love. There'll be archetypes that will rotate out of standards. There'll be a deck list that will rotate out of standard, but it'll have like a, once you adjust like 12 to 20 cards, there'll be a version of it in an older format, for example. And people, yeah, gravitate towards being able to play those things and become masters of their, their stuff. You know, we talk about Warhammer players who are like, you know, masters of playing Tau and can even play them when they're at their worst. You get that in, in Magic more so people will be specialist deck pilots that won't change from an archetype even when new stuff gets released but that said there is a thing now where the newer sets that go straight into the older formats things that are called modern horizons they print new cards that go straight into modern they avoid standard because they're too powerful these things are so power crept it's like a set of sacrosancts and morven vials right it's like it's all the good stuff and then modern now for example looks nothing like it did three years ago even though it's a non-rotating format because there's an artificial rotation where if you're not playing with the new toys they've just printed you're kind of playing at a disadvantage Really? Um, and I believe even with the old to, format. Yes, even the old format. So, like Jace the Mind Sculptor is the most famous, powerful planeswalker of all time, right? Hardly sees any play. There's like maybe one deck in Legacy that plays it as a one-off because it's just it's power crept out. It's not good enough anymore. And you see that a lot. There's a there's a card called Merc Tide Regent. It's this new creature that is just de facto the best creature in the game, basically. And it got printed last year in a, in a Modern Horizons set. So it used to be that the Eternal formats, every set, there'd be one or two cards that just about make it in because they're powerful enough to do something in a fringe deck. Now, with the power creep we had during the big periods of bans and then the Modern Horizons sets, like the old formats get rocked their core constantly with new additions. It's not the same problem with Warhammer where you, know, you don't have to paint up these cards and build them and stuff right but it is still frustrating to have a deck that you thought that would never rotate like like delver and legacy and then suddenly you need four ragavans four milk tide regents four unholy heats and four dragonway channels that's like 16 cards immediately from a new set that transforms your deck overnight and that's a common phenomenon at the moment i believe that is a conscious decision from the company to monetize the older format so people aren't just playing their old cards but, they have to buy the new stuff but these come out like once a year once every two years or something like that is that yeah roughly speaking yeah okay and then for for the i guess popularity of the formats where does the support come from like are these formats well let me say how does wizards support them or is it more of a players holding all these things up so it used to be that Grand Prix, which are the magic equivalent of GTs, would be where these formats get played. Um, there'd be side events, but then the main events too. There'd be, there'd be several modern ones a year. There'd be one or two legacy ones a year. Just before COVID, we had a controversy where Wizards moved away from supporting legacy at that level. So they were like, we're not going to have any legacy GPs anymore. And I thought that was a big mistake because legacy GPs sell out. Legacy players who want to play with their old cards normally have quite a bit of disposable income because they're, they're a bit older, the players. They will travel. And these things would always sell out. But Wizards were claiming it wasn't financially viable. I think that might have changed by now because of this new me method of giving us new cards that break the older formats. Um, nowadays, though, you do you do get like um, uh, larger legacy tournaments in Europe and stuff and being held by like local game stores and things. So it's, those things are being kept alive by the community. Um, Modern and Pioneer, for example, are still pretty popular with Wizards. Pioneer, which is uh, the last, I don't know, eight years of cards, something like that, roughly speaking, maybe 10. No, no, about eight years. That's going to be a Pro Tour format. So the Pro Tour is Wizards endorsed big um, fancy esports showcase. And they're bringing that back to paper this year, at the end of this year, at the end of next. Big announcements that they're bringing back to paper because it's all on Arena, our digital client, for a while. And they're going to be doing it with Pioneer. There's, there's a theory they're doing that to push it so they can sell more Pioneer products down the line, like products that reprint Pioneer staples. Mm hmm. Um, which is a different dynamic to, to Warhammer, right? Everything's always in print with Warhammer, where with Magic, we need reprints to make things accessible. But yeah, Pioneer is a hot thing for Wizards right now. They're, they're super excited for it and supportive of it. Nice. I don't know if we've really answered the question or whatever, but it sounds like they are active participants, like Wizards is active participants in at least uh, trying to keep interest. Yeah, so, so all the formats do have... None of them feel dead, dead to, like, players. So... Like, even the oldest format, the most ridiculous format, which is Vintage, where, like, Black Lotus is legal and the decks cost tens of thousands, they're still playable on MTGO, which is our, like, digital client, the old digital client. 
And so that still exists. And then Pauper, which is only like the most common of cards, is like the common rarity. Uh, what is the rule of that? It's either <laughs> is it is it common or is it like under a dollar no, value? It's, it's all commons. It's all commons. Okay. Um, that, so Pauper is actually recently got a like a, a rules council created where they've got like eight people from the community who are big Pauper players, put them on a council, and they get to like vote on whether things need to be banned or not. So that it's kind of like there is a group of people you can talk to who are sanctioned by wizards to mod uh, to moderate the format basically uh, and they might do that for legacy eventually as well um hopefully maybe they'll reach out to me who knows but yeah so so wizards are like they're, they're really active in promoting the vast majority of formats it's only if something hasn't you mentioned about like under a dollar there's a thing called penny dreadful which is like a a, a, a grassroots thing where the legality of cards means they have to be le- worth less than a dollar and that gets checked once a month and then resets yeah, uh, super funny. interesting format it's a really cool format but wizards would never first of all wizards can't acknowledge the secondary market that's like yeah, yeah they, they don't they don't <laughs> i think they make it kind of like a thing to completely ignore the secondary market yeah, or at they, least pretend they, 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 cards are desirable but they don't have a secondary market cost. I think that's to avoid gambling laws, basically. Right. And they start admitting that some of the cards are worth 50 bucks. It's like a lottery ticket and they'll be in all sorts of world of hate and trouble, right? Uh, but yeah, Penny Dreadful will never be supported for that reason. And also, it's a fledgling thing that's fun and like really entrenched players know about it, but it's not really a big thing. Um, we've got we've got off, the, we've got off the rails a little bit here. There's a load of formats that all... <laughs> supported to an extent but there's like three or four that are the big ones that wizards will hold events for and tournaments for but even the bigger events that hold for those bigger formats will have side events that will fire so i play a lot of legacy at gps before covid i'll just go along i'll go to the side events just play legacy at the legacy event and meet people from around the world you have come to play legacy yeah but that's not really comparable to warhammer because warhammer doesn't even have side events at, uh, at gts you can't just drop and play in a side event right? it's, it's quite uh, that is that is changing that's less of a that, that is happening more often at some of the larger events especially like the u.s open series where they're um an ad- yeah. adepticon some some of the more uh experience driven events are starting to have these types of things yeah because i've always found it weird like when i was at london gt that i couldn't if i was doing bad i couldn't drop and like join the pickup event sort of thing yeah. LBO, magic, same thing. So normal, you know? if you draw uh, now like I'm, I'm only highlighting very specific things because those, those are ones i know about there may be others but that is something to that is at least on the mind of warhammer players now uh over the last you know few years or so yeah but i think I'm, um but that's also only for people who are really minded towards i want to win something like really i'm going to stay in the main event just play games of warhammer because i want to play with my army against yeah. like-minded individuals but if you if you are dead to top eight or whatever you might want to go and try and win the rt or, or whatever the yeah. pickup event is. that's it well, there should I, be more of that. i can't have you on without changing topics just a little bit about talking about the magic warhammer crossover oh okay <laughs> I mean, we don't know anything about it. You know, we, at least we know very little about it, I guess I should say, uh, from this well, side. We got a load of information dumped about two weeks ago. We know the factions. Um, we know the key art. We know, like, um, we even know price points, roughly speaking. So I can, I can give you a lot of info. Well, no, it. this is the commanders. <laughs> this is the, yes, so this is the format about, you were yeah. talking about before. I don't know if you want to, like, briefly describe what that is. Yeah, so commander is basically four players sit at a table and you shuffle up. You've got a hundred card deck. It's singleton rules. So you can only have one of each uh, card in your deck in terms of unique names, barring basic lands. Uh, you have a commander, which sits in your command zone, which is basically your warlord, if you imagine it that way. Uh, and then the first person, well, the last person alive wins. You start at 40 life, a lot more life than normal. There's a lot more base buildy, build up, battle cruisery sort of magic. Although there is a there is a thing called CDH, which is the high powered version of this, um, which is where you want to kill everyone on turn three or four. But that's like comboing that. off things that affect the whole tables go infinite quote unquote <laughs> yeah, exactly. but that's and not there are tournaments yeah. there are tournaments for that that's the interesting thing there's, there's there was um, a tournament called Marquesa recently which is where CDH players go along and compete in this so my, yeah you can get your competitive itch anywhere I guess nice. yeah commander is meant to be the casual free for all kitchen table beer and pretzels magic and how do you feel about this kind of like crossing the streams here i am beyond excited yeah. i was quite a critical I person about the initial like crossovers to like walking dead and even stranger things that i'm quite a big fan of it just felt very weird and not not magic but i've come around to that i'm not excited for the Fortnite crossover <laughs> but um <laughs> but, but warhammer feels more adjacent warhammer is also in my interests um and all the cards in the command decks are also legal and legacy so there might be a situation where I get to play a tournament where I use my Stoneforge Mystic from Magic to collect like a, a melter gun and I equip it to like a unicorn and shoot someone. That'd be pretty funny. 
Oh, so it is there, there's no going to, or at least, at least we don't know about now, restrictions about bringing it into the old, like, actual turtle format where everything yeah. is legal kind of thing. So so basically in Legacy, everything is legal. So any Commander product is legal there. So these decks will be, just, just by virtue of how the system works, they're legal in, in Legacy. And we've also got, we've got game, I'm not going to phone, so we've got Lord of the Rings coming uh, early next year. So we might have a situation in Legacy where there might be, like, blue-red Gandalf might be a metagame deck. And then we might have like green black um, Zeech or something like oh it would be great back it'd be a blue black wouldn't it or something but we might have situations where decks are named after cart like things from other intellectual properties which is kind of funny. That's, um, those are <laughs> if you're basically you get to name the deck if you win with it. And that's uh, yeah yeah there's deck names it's similar to how we have um you have city thing. names in Warhammer you have like um thick city and all this sort of stuff it's just colloquial names for decks yeah. colloquial names for understanding like lists and how they differ to other versions of that list. But these commander decks that are coming out are all Warhammer themed so you you could know nothing else about the rest of yep. the magic property and still just get your deck that's completely Warhammer exactly. themed in play so, so every single card is Warhammer themed in name and art or or the name will be like you know will fit within Warhammer um, so we're gonna, even the basic lands we haven't seen them yet but like plains mountains islands forests and swamps will be themed after places on planets within 40k or look like the situations in 40k. So we might have them where they're like in the background, you can see a, a ship or a city or a Titan. So, I mean, even, even the lands are going to be Warhammer themed. Oh, um, awesome. I, I'm beyond excited. I'm so hyped. Yeah. So do you think any of your, uh, your magic buddies are going to want to take the, the jump into Warhammer? <laughs> Maybe. But to be fair, I've had, I've had more Warhammer creators approach me about playing the EDH decks, the commander decks with them than I've had uh, magic players want to know about Warhammer. I guess because it's giving us a new... Because you can literally buy the four decks and sit down, and that is like a board game experience. Yeah. You can play right there and then. Uh, so it's more it's more Warhammer players interested in the magic rule set than the other way around. For now. I've done that before, too. What about too, where... you? Are you going to buy them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, But even, even in the past... I mean, I play magic now, mostly online, though. And uh, But I, I've got my little collection of cards that, you know, whenever I retire one day, I know I can, can break them out and play Warhammer, play D&D, or play magic to my heart's content, you know. Hopefully it's a long time from now. <laughs> you know, but so are you, yeah. uh, which deck are you most excited about? Is it the Imperium deck? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm really, I want to see how it all comes together. Uh, I probably will, will play the Imperium, although it's going to be, it seems to be real slated towards Ultramarines, you know, so. Uh, yeah, we know we've got a Kalgar and the Suppressors of Blue as well. I'm really hoping there are, is at least one other flavor of Marine in there. it would be a waste if there's not, but. So I'm going to try, I'm probably going to, sl- you know, go with the Chaos first. Yep. Uh, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. But I, I am excited about doing it. But we've I've done that in the past, too, where you, you mentioned it's a board game experience where, you know, the pre-constructed decks um, have enough, like, interactive, interactive things and teeth in them to where you can have a cool experience with people from various skill levels or maybe even zero skill level if they just understand the basic principles of the game and at a kitchen table. Yeah, and they should be balanced against one another as well. That's that's the uh, the idea. There's always normally one outlier because that's just the nature of gaming, right? But yeah, the four should be balanced against one another to create like like a, an even footing for you to play this like sort of board game like experience. Nice. Well, uh, I think mean, again we didn't solve the world's problems today, but I I really <laughs> wanted to bring you on and you know and, and just get some insight of how you know another game with a with a thriving competitive environment deals with you know having to make a change changes or adjustments or shifts. In a I, living, I, I, would like to, I would like to add that I think just before we finish up is yeah. that I do think Games Workshop are on the right track. I actually think they're doing a really, and they might be a bit slow. Well, no, that's not true. They are too slow to react. That's just a fact, right? We see it like week in, week out. Where people are like, well, are they going to fix this custodies problem? But when I got into the hobby all of about two years ago, when I started to veer towards wanting to go to tournaments and events to see stuff, there wasn't really data slates as such. There was balance changes in points and things, right? So for them to start doing regular data slate updates and bringing in like a seasonal thing, I think I think the Warzone books are a, <laughs> uh, a bit of a cash grab, right? Forcing you to buy a new book every couple of months. But that said, with all the tools we've got as a community, I do think it's cool to see the game have like a regular balance update. It makes it more akin to your League of Legends or your StarCraft or whatever in terms of patching. I think that's a good thing. Nice, man. Well, thanks for coming on and, and spending the time. Uh, I'll put some links where people can find you, but where where can people find you the most often? <laughs> YouTube.com forward slash Pleasant Kenobi. I make Magic the Gathering and Warhammer every Wednesday uh, videos and Twitch.tv as well. I've been streaming a lot of Chaos Gate. Uh, I stream Magic, of course, as well. There are two main places where all the magic happens, if you will. Sweet, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. No, thank you for having me on, friend. You're listening to Forge the Narrative.
everybody, we are back. I hope you enjoyed that segment with our special guest. Now it's me and Red Powell. What up, Red? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I know we've, uh, you know, it's almost like a, a, a turnstile here for this episode, but hopefully people will be patient with us and enjoy the, the stuff. I hope so. But, I appreciate it. So this is lar- This episode has been largely around balance and a healthy competitive environment. You know, and, and is are the games specifically like Magic and Warhammer Forty Thousand? Are they comparable? And are they doing enough? And or are they doing too much? You know, do we get? Is it happen too frequently? Is it? I mean, I think that every as a war game designer myself, I think that every game can always continue to improve. I think that that's that's in order to to constantly remain relevant and. Uh, engaging for its community, you have to do that. But at the same time, I mean, I think that the game is is at a very interesting point. I, I think that it's it's almost what I would argue is too soon to tell in regards of how they're going about and trying to approach it now because it's been how many? I mean, we're we're only looking at two short seasons so far of how they've adjusted right between Octarius and Nockmund, right? And, and so between those two, I mean, it, it's arguable that that you could say we we still need to see it play out. Like data sets need more time to be able to develop if this is the correct approach or not. And so I, I love that they're trying it like this. I mean, we've seen, you know, and, and we, as in us, the you, know, you and I, Paul, we, we've seen it over time, what it looks like when you wait years before uh, addition adjustments or codex adjustments mm-hmm. uh, up to now where we're seeing it in a matter of months. And so I think that the the game designers and the the rules team that's out there that that they're approaching it in an interesting way to say the least. I'm not saying that it's not balanced. I think that as we saw with the development of, and I'm I'm sure Adam probably talked to this to a point, but the the armor of contempt, and it wasn't just cutting back or nerfing as you might call it the you know the newer codexes but also giving bonuses to the other codexes we've talked about that before and the balances that they've done i think that is it, it has some fair implications because as we've seen even with sisters doing as well as they have in certain events recently giving benefits to teams that may not have received newer codexes is has done pretty well in certain regards from my position yeah uh, so you're supportive of this? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say so far that the, I'm supportive of always of innovation space. And I think that even from previous where we saw it with the adjustments from White Dwarfs and what they brought in and they've adjusted, I, I think it's great. I think that it's it's awesome. I think it keeps people engaged in different ways. You know, they're they're dropping new codexes for different Xenos factions at the same time that they're they're dropping the Morta factors, for example, in a White Dwarf and, and different aspects like that. And I think it's fun that it, we get to play around with that. I know that there's certain aspects to, you know, do you have the White Dwarf or are you using, I wish Adam was here right now for me to throw the app out there again, as far as the, the you know, updated faction rules and things like that for what comes out in White Dwarf. I mean, I think the pace at which they're dropping things and, and the, uh, the seasonal aspect is is pretty interesting. I'm I, I think that the jury is still out in regards of if it's good or not. But that's why we do these things. That's why you 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 execute and experiment with innovative space because if it doesn't work, then slow it down. That's fine. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to just trash my. <laughs> I'm not going to trash several armies just because they experimented with a rollout scenario of, okay, seasonal rules over quarters or something like that. Right. So I, I think it's worth experimenting with by all means. Uh, nice. No, I, I think, I think that's right. Uh, I think that that's some great perspective and it's one of those topics to where I think some, some people are always going to feel like it is too much and some people are always going to feel like it's not enough. And, you know, one of the points that we made earlier in, in the show is that, you know, we're talking about a very specific set of constraints of competitive play to where we could walk into any game store or any any table anywhere in the world and everyone knows just what the expectations of the play experience is going to be. And if you're playing not in that environment, you can more easily craft, have time to craft, 
whatever you want that play experience to be. And so we're talking about a very specific set of play experiences. Absolutely. And I, I think that you're right. I mean, it's, it is very specific. And I think that for a lot of folks, um, I'm not going to say the majority, I'm not going to say the general or whatever. I, I think it is very specific group in this competitive aspect, going to these larger events on a, on a consistent and uh, expansive basis, really. I mean, we're talking all the way from the UK to Spain to to all sorts of environments, not just in the US and where this this competitive environment is playing itself out for for a lot of other folks that maybe aren't traveling to these broader uh, events consistently, you know, for your own community. I, I, I don't think that it has to be as as dynamic as maybe some of the competitive environment plays it out to be. I do think that there is a little bit of um, maybe availability bias in regards to the competitive environment and the meta watch aspect and things like that. Whereas your own meta and your own community plays itself out in a different way that doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, as some people maybe are concerned about jerked around by the development in the competitive environment. I I, I just don't think that that's, it doesn't have to be the case, right? Um, I I can understand where some people might feel that that is the pressure of it, but I I don't think it's necessary by any means. Yeah, well, we'll see how this all plays out over the course of these seasons in this development and this edition. I'm enjoying it so far. I have too. I mean, and I've I've gotten to play uh, sporadically in some of the larger events, but even in, in the more local community. I mean, just being able to to try things out and see how people are are approaching the different codexes and and the metas and and trying to prepare for some of the metas. I think it's been pretty exciting. I think that it's there's been a lot of development and uh, a lot of opportunity for people with different armies. That's for sure. So uh, this weekend, by the time people are hearing this, the Age of Darkness set will be up for pre-order. I'm changing gears just a little bit no so, please he- heresy stuff will will be very much on people's minds and i think i'm going to use this as an excuse uh to kind of revamp my blood angels for i mean for mm. heresy specifically but I've, I've seen people you know i'm so i'm, I'm definitely co op in this idea but doing a very second edition paint scheme on the blood angels mm. now and, and- can you describe, yeah, exactly what that, what that, I mean, we're not talking just a bunch of red armor with yellow helmets. What, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, you, you know, you nailed it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So I, what I, I want to use the modern red. So the blood angels used to have kind of like an orangish tint to the red. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't want to lean back into that, but what you would see was a lot of the weapon casings or like the, uh, the casing around the, the very tips of like last cannons or the melta barrels or whatever were yellow, like the, like the, the bright yellow. And so I've got a pretty good yellow recipe for how I do the helmets now, but I was thinking, you know, there's gotta be some, it's easier now to paint yellow than it ever has been. And so I got fishing around for some tutorials and that, that landed me on an Imperial fist tutorial, uh, by uh, I think the the guy on YouTube I think Richard Gray uh, that's the you can so if you want to go check out this tutorial but basically how to do a a yellow but he also does some weathering in this in this video and for years and years and years I've I've been of the mind that Blood Angels always they're always going to try to make their armor look as good as possible before they go into you know while they're on the battle barges you know it's going to look as pristine as possible when they go land on the planet for wherever the engagement. But in the heresy, the whole idea is that they're basically fighting for their lives across the galaxy, you know, for what they think is the fate of humanity. And so maybe they don't. So anyway, this this tutorial, Painting Yellow, uh, I will say I do think it is, my, my tutorial for yellow is is uh, nothing fancy. It is Averland Sunset. You basically get a lot of work done with Averland Sunset. Mm. It is. I mean, you know, to be fair, sometimes you got to get dirty. I get it. You know? Yeah, but so like, how do I make it a little bit more special? I'm like, well, maybe, maybe put some weathering on this. So we kind of have a blend of, uh, and I don't mean like probably not crazy weathering, but l- this tutorial uses a lot of oil washes, which is something if you're looking to like branch out into a new painting technique, oil washes, I think the most expensive thing in the oil wash is actually getting the odorless mineral spirits. Mm. And you could probably even get that less expensive from a hardware store. Mm. Do not quote me on that though, <laughs> because I, yeah. I don't know if the mineral spirits 
from the hardware store containers are the same as you get in the bottles from like the specialty painting shops. Yeah, I'm, I'm as, a, as someone who worked in a paint store, I guess my initial recommendation would be to uh, not follow that just because I, I think that there may be some risk associated with the mineral spirits from uh, a more industrial aspect compared to the hobby aspect. So I'd just be very, 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 very careful with that. But I, I think that that's a really great point as far as how you can approach some ways to, to weather down or, or bring out different aspects of colors. Well, the, the wash is to, to get contrast on the models. That's kind of what it was, mm-hmm. the, the, the way the, the, um, the enamels stuff and the oils work right. is that you can put them on the model and then you, they since they have a long drying time you can spend a lot of time manipulating them to get them exactly where you want and then you can get you know there's there's a lot of hobby grade let's just say don't go get it from a hardware store get hobby grade stuff <laughs> i mean you know to your point though i mean everybody's got at least a handful of firstborn marines out there why not uh, you got you got space and <laughs> You've got the, you've likely got the inventory to experiment. So, I mean, there, there's nothing saying you can't, but it, it, I would just say definitely experiment before you fully commit between hobby version uh, versus, uh, you know, hardware. Uh, so w- with this stuff, uh, with the long drying time, you get to kind of move the product around. And then mm-hmm. uh, even after it, it spends a little bit time of time curing, you can go back with like a, a cotton bud and clean up places that you want to have a brighter highlight. But again, looking for ways people to get stuff on the table. I think experimenting with the the oils and the enamel type stuff might be an interesting way of getting some things done, uh, including some of this like real gritty kind of industrial weathering. And he also uses uh, weathering powder. And that's great for creating like real texture and dust. It also leads into like, I'm actually going to have uh, one of the, like a friend of the show, Shadows Edge Miniatures has a new weathering powder product line launching soon on Kickstarter. Mm. Going to talk about that next week, I think. Uh, so if you're looking to get into this, might be there might be some deals on that you could check out if you haven't experimented with these things before. I'm going to give it a shot on my hero see blood angels the new here see blood angels and so i'm going to try to i'm going to try to do this kind of like retro scheme with my modern red but using the yellow as the weapon tips and that kind of stuff oh yeah and see if i can pull this off and then maybe go a little bit more dimension a little bit of weathering because they're fighting that you know the battle <laughs> for their lives mm. this is a rough time it's hard time man that's what Can't i thought all be pretty sorry yeah, you you yeah you get never you know you never get a moment to to rest. That's that's the whole like pace and stuff of the heresy that I think that the the uh, they're going with. That's cool. So we'll see. But that's our show this week. Got a quick hobby segment, more of a tutorial, but and then, uh, you know, the what I liked about this tutorial is that it, it it doesn't seem to skip any steps and shows you the whole way and also show kind of shows some products that you might uh, be curious about and how to easily get into that. And then also the practical application of being descriptive in that narrative about the the ongoing war, which I think is kind of cool because when you're playing with mm-hmm. these things, it's kind of what we're trying to do, mm-hmm. especially in the heresy. Well, dude, that's our show this week. Right, I'm glad you could make nice. it. Me too, man. Uh, we'll hope, try to be back with the whole cast next week. Uh, and until Can't then, wait. yeah, leave us some five star reviews. Please like, share, subscribe, leave a comment or something like that. We really appreciate it, and we'll see y'all then. See you. said but i already subscribed you better do it too